The more that people are able to understand what is happening here in Chemical Valley and connect it to the climate crisis, as well as to ongoing colonialism in Canada, the closer that we'll be to a more livable future. So science and technology are social and political. And I work in a field called technoscience, which is concerned with how humans interact with technology using the scientific method. But techno-scientists like myself acknowledge that the scientific method is historically situated, it's socially encoded, and it's deeply political. And so it requires indigenous, feminist, queer, anti-racist and anti-colonial views and standpoints in order to make it more rigorous. Now you're working on the Land and Refinery Past, Present and Future project. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that project is about and sort of what challenges you were trying to solve through that project? So the Land and Refinery project is a collaborative project housed in the Technoscience Research Unit and it is looking at the histories and the operations of the Imperial Oil Refinery in Sarnia or in Canada's Chemical Valley, which is where 40% of Canada's petrochemicals are processed. Our project is looking at how Chemical Valley came to be through different colonial processes, through different government strategies, policies, laws and regulations, and why Canada this chemical valley is so dense and so polluted and why it operates on uh, Anishinaabeg territory. So this is a visual representation of the amount of plastic pellets that were found around some of the beaches in Chemical Valley. And what you can see comparatively to the rest of the sites that were sampled is that it's very dense. There's a lot of them and that makes sense because in Chemical Valley you have the bulk of plastics manufacturing. So we came together on the Land and the Refinery project in the winter of 2017. Now it coincided with a event at the Imperial Oil Refinery. On February 23rd, there was this violent flaring incident. And from the other side of the St. Clair River, it looked as though the whole refinery was on fire. But this is Imperial Oil? This feels a little extreme. It smells awful, too. The facility itself, Imperial Oil, didn't want to account for anything. A few investigations were launched following that, one of which was led by Vanessa Gray, along with EcoJustice, who was calling for an investigation into this particular incident. Now, though no charges were laid, what did come of the incident is that myself and Professor Murphy got into contact with Vanessa and asked her if she'd be interested in collaborating on a project. And part of this uh, sort of leads into the Pollution Reporter app. So the Pollution Reporter app has a couple of functions. The first thing that it does is it helps facilitate easier uh, reporting of pollution events in Chemical Valley. So previously to report a pollution event and still, you have to call the Spills Action Center. You get an operator that's very far away from your location. They have no other information. They'll ask you many different questions. It can take quite a long time. And often you don't get a follow-up. What the app does is it allows you to input all of that data. It generates a form that sends through your email client directly to the ministry, where you have a place where you can follow up with them about what actions were or were not taken. The next thing that the app does is it stories the history of Chemical Valley. So as I was saying, Chemical Valley is a really old place. It's older than Canada itself. It starts over two decades before Confederation and arguably before that. Additionally, what we do is we connect very disaggregated environmental data on chemical pollution to known health harms and health effects, all in accessible, translatable language. As an Indigenous feminist and researcher, I know that the health of our lands is vital to the health of our bodies. I feel like I have a responsibility I think we all have a responsibility to hold the industries, the companies, and the governments responsible for the creation of pollution and health harms.
In computer vision um, as a whole, or in machine learning AI as a whole, the way that the systems work is that their data, they're dependent on the data that kind of shapes the, um, the model. So you'll have examples of information that's sort of fed to a computer. And based off of those examples, the computer will make predictions about future examples or, or new information that it hasn't seen before. Uh, one of the challenges in the field right now is that a lot of the examples being shown to these uh, computers to develop you know, AI models or AI systems um, are, are not representative of the real world. So you might have a lot of data sets, for example, that don't include um, anyone that looks like me. And this is very common in facial recognition in particular, where it's kind of easy to tell. Um, and as a result, uh, when you sort of uh, teach a computer that a face can't look like mine, um, when you train a model on that data, um, the model is going to make a lot of mistakes um, and, uh, on faces that are darker skinned. So that is a big issue in the field and it continues to cause a lot of um, real world damage. There's already been at least two or three cases reported in the US and some in Canada of um, individuals being misidentified by false facial recognition matches and that escalating to a false arrest, uh, which can obviously be a very disruptive event in the life of any individual. You talked about speaking out and raising awareness on uh, facial recognition and bias. Continuing to, 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 to raise your point and staying loud about this issue um, through that documentary on, on Netflix. Uh, Joy kind of underplayed uh, uh, what was happening during the filming of that documentary. So she just invited me to sort of come hang out. I was, I was um, doing some research in New York at the time. The lead author of the paper, who is somebody that I mentor, she is an undergraduate at the University of Toronto. You know, we, we wrote a, a follow-up paper discussing exactly what these failures were and exactly who these systems were failing. So the performance discrepancy was something like, uh, you know, was performing at about 100% for lighter skinned men and less than 70% accuracy for darker skinned women. So kind of putting those numbers beside each other in a way that would garner the kind of visibility and attention required for the advocacy work to happen. You're doing such important work. And you're also addressing who has access to technology, who has access to computer science um, through your non-for-profit. Can you talk a little bit about why you launched Project Include? I hadn't actually been exposed to coding before my first year um, at U of T, like my first semester, first year. And it's something that kind of bugged me that, um, you know, certain people from a particular background had immediate access, you know, from the age of like, 10, you know, to these coding camps and uh, to opportunities to learn how to program. So um, me and a couple of friends, we decided that what we wanted to do was we wanted to go into, you know, specific needs improvement neighborhoods as marked by the city. So these are often um, immigrant neighborhoods or low income neighborhoods, and we would bring the computers and uh, we would we would show up at the at libraries in these neighborhoods and we would teach those kids in the neighborhood about coding and and uh, think creatively with, you know, this technical skill and, and build something that they could find joy or find um, use in. Um, and that was really the premise of, of Project Include. And it actually continues today. The org is now like five years old. And um, in total, we've instructed over a thousand kids over the years, which is unbelievable to me. So I want to go back to your own experience, um, you know, building a career in tech and sort of what barriers need to be removed so that other women of color can find success working in tech, AI, machine learning. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it was easy. I think there was a lot of moments where I really questioned if I should stay in the field. And I credit, you know, mentors like Timnit Gebru and Joy um, Blimweeny for, you know, sitting me down and like giving me that pep talk of like, you know, you have to stay, you have to stay. <laughs> um, so I think having mentorship and a support system for me is the reason I'm still in the field today. It requires support and community for you to make it through for sure.